The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. Okay, hi, uh, Martin Ware. Uh, so my talk again today is uh, entitled Health Services Research, Health Systems Research, Operations Research. Um, but we'll primarily focus on some case studies, make a couple of pro provocative comments, uh, and hopefully get some of you guys to talk, because Hamish told me it's tied to your grade. Uh, <laughs> so health information systems to improve quality of care and resource uh, poor settings. That's the title of the course, uh, which I thought was kind of interesting uh, <coughs> because just to go th uh, through the definitions of the three main components of uh, this class, right? So we are talking about resource poor countries, and again, most of you are very familiar with this. I won't belabor the point, uh, but in this case, we are talking about the low income and low to middle in income countries. And this is in real dollars, not uh, purchasing power parity. Go to the World Bank sites, they list a whole bunch of countries as low income countries. And this was from this year. Most of them are in Sub Saharan Africa or Southeast Asia. And then you have the low middle to middle income countries, uh, which is a whole bunch of other countries, including China and India. Uh, but what you see there is when you're talking about resource poor countries, you're talking about a broad array of countries with actually big differences in their technological capabilities and also the, the resources available to do some of these things. So just have that uh, as a thought there. And then the second thing in your class is uh, quality of care, okay? I'm sure somebody must have defined what quality of care is. And I get it from the Institute of Medicine, which typically is kind of a world leader in terms of, at least in the US, kind of define, uh, uh, helping uh, move, move medicine forward, especially in terms of um, what standards we should use for different things. So they define quality of care as the degree to which health services for individual populations increase the likelihood of desired health outcomes and are consistent with the uh, current professional guidelines or uh, standard of care, okay? So again, quality of care, most of the time you're really talking about what the outcome is and does the care help lead to those outcomes, okay? Now, if you look at the elements for quality of care, okay, it's pretty simple. Uh, recognize which patients are at risk for particular diseases, uh, give them the appropriate evaluation, uh, provide them with appropriate diagnosis and treatment, make sure they get the appropriate follow-up, and uh, make sure that they adhere to the care that they should be getting, okay? So again, just definition here. That's quality of care. Okay? And then health information technology, which if you talk to many people, you'll find that nobody really knows what exactly they, they mean when they talk about health information technology and health information systems, which is in your cause. Because somebody could say, well, a health information system does not require anything electronic, right? You could have a simple paper-based system that works very well a very efficient work process and good doctors taking good care of patients with no electronic medical records. So when you're talking about health information systems, what do we exactly mean, okay? My extrapolation was that you are talking about some form of electronic technology as part of the framework for this cause. So I kind of just uh, try to get what we classically mean by the definition of health IT. I could be wrong, but you could correct me if that was, okay? So uh, health information technology is again, application of information processing involving use of computers or similar kind of electronic technologies like mHealth uh, that deals with storage, retrieval, sharing, and using health information, uh, data, and knowledge for communication and for decision making. So not only do you collect, retrieve, and use the information, but you can also use it for artificial intelligence, com computerized decision support, and things of that sort, okay? So given those three, three definitions, um, you end up saying, well, let's make some statements 
and ask some questions, right? So I think most people in this group would agree that, you know, maybe we have poor quality of care in resource limited settings. Uh, you can say, well, patients at risk for diseases are not recognized. For example, a lot of people who have HIV uh, don't know that they're HIV positive in developing countries, but the same happens in developed countries, right? Patients don't receive appropriate evaluations. They don't get appropriate diagnosis. Uh, most of them can't even get the treatment, and a lot of them end up not getting the appropriate follow-up. So not very controversial statement, but again, maybe a little bit more extreme in the developing or resource-poor countries, but we see a lot of this here too, okay? Now, you could say quality of care is linked to the resources. Again, it's a general extrapolation. You know, you could argue, for example, that, okay, U.S. spends a lot of money uh, for its medical care, but it's not the best in terms of the quality of care that people receive. But on a larger scheme of things, generally, the more money you spend, and if it's spent appropriately, the better quality of care you have. And also, the more human resources you have to take care of your people, theoretically, the better the quality of care they should receive. Okay? Uh, and again, the exceptions here and there. Then you end up asking, is, are the resources either here or in developing countries or resource poor countries currently being optimally used uh, for the care that they're supposed to be providing? That's number one. And then number two is, are they spending the appropriate amount of resources relative to the pie that they have to take care of their population? Again, that's just something to think about, okay? And um, this is, I don't know if you can see that well, but you know, kind of to make the point that, you know, resource poor countries offer worse quality of care. We look at the just major health indicators, you know, from life expectancy. On the left side is Africa. The third one is sub, sub East, uh, Southeast Asia. So the, the, the two which kind of typically have most of the resource poor countries. So the life expectancy uh, at birth is lower for these countries relatively. Uh, adult mortality is a little bit higher. Africa again is on the left. Uh, Southeast Asia is the third one there. And the five mortality is higher for both. You know, and you go through all those things and it kind of uh, reflects that general trend that resource poor countries, a little bit of lower quality of care in terms of outcome. And then healthcare expenditure is the lo lower um, right hand corner there. And as you can see, they end up spending a little bit less on their healthcare relative to the other countries, okay? Now, and then we talk about health information technology and the question now comes, does health information technology improve quality of care, okay? And I know we are all sitting here because we are obviously interested in the role of health information technology in quality of care. So this review, which is a systematic review of other systematic reviews, just came out this year, okay? And I don't like to quote big chunks of, uh, of articles, but I felt that we needed to kind of just put this straight. And again, remember, this refers to developing and developed country. Most of the data is from developed countries, okay? So this is what they say. We found that, the, that despite support from policymakers, there was little empiric evidence to substantiate the claim made in relation to these technologies, meaning health information technology. Whether the success of those relatively few solutions identified to improve quality and safety would continue if they were deployed beyond the context in which they were originally de developed has yet to be established. Importantly, best practice guidelines in effective development and deployment strategies are lacking, okay? So maybe I poured some cold water on the enthusiasm here, okay? But this is actually the facts on the ground. And I think, you know, policymakers and other people in the group uh, need to know that, you know, there's a little bit of disconnect in terms of what we are saying these technologies can do and actually the facts on the ground, okay? So the conclusion of this paper, and this is hopefully the largest chunk of quotations I'll have for you. So there's a large gap between the postulated and empirically demonstrated benefits of he health technologies. In addition, there's a lack of robust research on the risks of implementing these technologies. Their cost effectiveness has yet to be demonstrated despite being 
frequently promoted by policymakers and techno enthusiasts as if they were a given. Okay? So, to me, um, I think we should sit, by the way, this is, I'm, I'm an electronic medical records person, but you know, at the end of the day, we have to say, where is the data that we are claiming these things can do, okay? This is not to say that in limited settings, health information technology has not been shown to work, okay? There are several settings, we'll demonstrate some here, where this technology actually works well, okay? But the question is, can we translate this technology into broader policy, you know? If I say people need to be immunized for measles, you know, we know it works. If you take it to another country, we know it works, okay? How about health information technology? Can we just blankly say, well, Kenya, where I'm from, implement electronic medical records everywhere? You know, as the Minister of Health has said, show me the evidence. Unfortunately, some of that evidence is lacking right now. Anyway, so the evidence in resource poor countries is lacking, first of all, but you have to remember again, lack of evidence does not mean necessarily lack of benefit, right? So we have to actually do a little bit more to try to find the evidence for these technologies, okay? And then you could even say, you know, for resource limited countries, you know, could they actually potentially benefit more from these technologies primarily because they don't have the resources, right? So, for example, if we don't have enough doctors in a country, okay, could you say, well, how about using nurses assisted by technology to almost act like doctors, okay? So, but theoretically, look, there's a potential that actually technology might have even more impact in these countries if implemented well. Still not completely proven, but at least it's, it's worth thinking about, okay? So, at least at this stage in the game, for a lot of the health IT things, and again, I'll, I'll welcome discussions later on or even now, I think we're in the stage where we have to say, you know, let's try to figure out the aspects of health information technology that actually make a difference or make an impact in these settings, and the aspects that actually do not make an impact, and then advocate or uh, vote against uh, the things that uh, Advocate for those that make a difference and those that do not make a difference. And the, th the other point I wanted to make on this slide is, you know, when you listen to a lot of these discussions about these systems, including part of my talk today, you're going to hear several things. You know, I'll tell you, you know, we had an impact, okay? But typically, it's an impact on a healthcare process, okay? The clinic, work, the clinic worked better, people liked it, people changed their behavior or did something else. But a lot of times, we are not impacting the outcome or we have not shown any impact on the outcome. So, you know, we really have to be clear what we are talking about here. Are we talking about you know, changing outcome measures or changing behavior or are we talking about outcome? Now, remember the definition of quality of care, okay? It was primarily outcome. It wasn't on process measures. But maybe process measures are a way to lead you to outcome measures. But again, right now, most of the data is on outcome, behavior, and things like that. And, and sorry, behavior and process measures are not on outcomes, okay? And then even when you can tell me that something has a positive outcome, you have to prove to me that it is cost effective in that setting, okay? If I'm sitting in a hospital and I don't have oral rehydration therapy, I don't have basic medication for malaria, okay? Where does health information technology fall on that scheme of things in terms of where I should spend my resources? And you can argue one or the other, but you, you really have to say, okay, you know, how much will it cost me to realize those benefits relative to all the other things that I have to take care of in these places that don't have the resources to do it? And those are the discussions nobody's having at this point, okay? Anyway. So I just had to get that off my back. So, <laughs> potential. But I think it's a worthwhile discussion uh, to have just to frame a cause like this, okay? Now, the potential role of health information technology in any healthcare system is kind of basic and also it's good to kind of separate, okay? You can use health information technology just to help you understand how the system works, okay? 
as an example, in the US right now, because I get messages for almost every event that happens for a patient in the hospital, I could easily track what happens from the time the patient walks into the hospital, what medications they're getting and when, to the time when they're going for tests and things like that. So just having that information can make you better understand how the health system works, okay? Uh, you can say health information technology can help you in improving how the system functions as a consequence help improve outcomes. So for example, the typical stuff, you know, make people more efficient and things like that, and then as a result, improve care. And then there's the last category where the health information technology itself is the intervention, okay? So say, you know, I'm gonna implement this decision support kind of reminder to tell them, you have to order this test now, okay? Uh, in which case you decide, well, does the technology itself actually end up leading to change in care or uh, patient outcome directly, okay? Um, some I got tied into this operations research talk type thing, so I'll try to sneak a few things here and there, okay? If you're gonna introduce any health IT solution uh, in any place, the first thing you have to, to ask yourself is, what problem am I trying to solve, right? And how will my technology affect uh, the system that I'm implementing it in, okay? I'll give you an example. So we go make a sale to Uganda, WHO, Ministry of Health, and say, hey, we have this perfect electronic medical record system. We want to implement it here, okay? And they say, well, you know, our guests don't know how to use computers. You're gonna make them slower, nah, nah, nah. So, you know, can you prove to us that this technology actually won't make things worse or better? Well, for you to do that, you have to first know how the clinic works, you know, how they spend their time and things like that before you can say, well, my technology actually did not make them any worse and maybe made them better, okay? So we did some work, okay? And titled Patterns of Care to HIV Clinics in Uganda. But this is actually pretty instrumental to some of the reading, I don't know if it was for this week, uh, that this is maybe the most relevant part to the reading. It's not very health information technology-like, but at least it's a little bit relevant, okay? So we went to Uganda, again, a little bit of uh, information about Uganda there. The two clinics we were interested in were in Barara and uh, Masaka, which are in southwestern Uganda. It's a beautiful, beautiful place. Again, um, you know, mortality, the life expectancy is in the low 50s, um, high infant mortality rates, and uh, uh, GN, uh, uh, gross national uh, GNI per capita is uh, about six, 460, and again, that's uh, real dollars. Okay, uh, we um, kind of this is my sketch of how the clinic works. You know, you are, you are, you are readings had a lot more elaborate stuff, so if your field is more particular, don't worry about this, how these things are drawn. But, you know, when you take a look here, like this is a typical clinic, they have one reception point, it doesn't really matter where the patient is going. And then, you know, patient comes in and then they, they say, well, we're gonna register you for the day and then, oh, you're going to VCT, you're going to this, you're going to this, okay. Uh, we were particularly interested in those people who are coming for their return visits where, where uh, our system was going to be used. You know, they go retrieve the charts, and again, say, okay, you're too ill, you're gonna go see the doctor, you just, you need antiretrovirals initiated, you need some counseling, and then go see the doctor. So it's a little bit complex, and then some patients go to pharmacies, some patients are admitted to the hospital. Typical kind of uh, clinic hospital type setting, okay? And from your readings, it's like multi-stage system where you go one place and, you know, and then you can start thinking about all the queuing things that you could use and all that stuff, okay? And we can talk about that a little bit later uh, in the slides, okay? So what we wanted to do was just say, well, how do uh, patients spend their time when they come to clinic? And how do uh, physicians spend their time when they're taking care of patients? And typically, at least in the medical field, there are several uh, methods uh, of looking at time use. And I have a couple of references there for you. We decided <coughs> to use the time motion methodology, which I'll describe. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> Basically, what, what you do in a time motion <coughs> methodology is you have <coughs> an observer <coughs> with a device of some kind, thank you, Hans, with a device of some kind uh, <coughs> tracking every activity that a patient or uh, the subject is doing and 
For each activity, there's a timestamp to it. Uh, you can imagine this is very boring, so you get people who like to do like very routine stuff, okay? Uh, but no, uh, for this study, we observed uh, adult patients, about 80 returning and 20 new patients, all primary uh, care providers. Again, primary care providers here, for one of the clinics, it was actually doctors, clinical officers, and uh, nurse practitioners, or people equivalent to nurse practitioners. And then in the other uh, clinic, it was uh, purely uh, doctors. So we also observed registration staff, pharmacy, and uh, things like that. I'll only report on the patient and uh, doctor data. Okay? But of course, for you to, to know what to record, you have to kind of sit there, know what they do, come up with the activities. We, used, uh, uh, we programmed all the activities into a device uh, using Pendragon forms. There are a lot of tools you could use to program it. And uh, you train the observers, and then the observers uh, go out and do the observations. Okay? So this is kind of an example of some of the physician tasks. So we have activities on the left. So let's say you know, they're putting some documents in the record or doing some filing. So that will say it's more than administrative task. If they're talking to a patient or family, we'd say that's uh, direct patient care, you know, things like that. You know, if they're reading a patient's chat, it's uh, indirect patient care because they're not really communicating with the patient at that point. Same with uh, patient activities, you know. If somebody's getting examined by a doctor, you know, you say that's, that's the time with the physician and things like that, okay? So you, uh, you do your observations on the device, you transfer them to a database of some kind, and then you, you analyze them. In this case, we used uh, Microsoft Access, you could use anything. We used SAS for statistical analysis, you could use any of the statistical software out there. Okay? Uh, boring, kind of routine stuff, you know, but uh, interesting what you find once the results start coming back, okay? So for the providers, we observed providers for about 140 hours total, okay? So the amount of time they spent in the clinic, okay? About, about five hours or so uh, at the two clinics. For an eight hour workday, on average they were in the clinic for five hours, okay? They did not like that result at all. Um, is that you, Hamish? Uh, let's see here. Uh, yeah, okay? And then if you look at the different start times of the clinic, right? So from about 8.56 to, uh, to 10.57, that's when the clinic started at some time, and then a little bit different in the other clinic, okay? So basically, for one of the clinics on one day, they were just hanging out until 11 before they started clinic, right? And in, these are the types of clinics where patients show up first thing in the morning. I mean, there's always a huge line um, waiting uh, in the morning, okay? If you look at the clinic end times, again, one date ended at 12.30 and another date ended at 5.21, okay? So huge variabilities, okay? And then the number of patients seen, you can look at the range. One day they saw six, uh, 16, uh, so this is per provider. So what, well, like the range is 16 patients per day to 48 patients per day and 19 to 41 patients per day at the other clinic, okay? And uh, the mean number of patients seen per hour is, again, they're pretty busy when they're working, okay? So interesting in itself when you think about a health system standpoint and how a system works. And I'm sure many people from different places are thinking, okay, I understand it or I know why, but it, it, the simple boring data actually tells you a lot about how the place functions. Uh, how they spend their time when they're taking care of patients. Look, look at the last uh, two right columns, which just aggregate things. So like, if you look at, um, indirect patient care, direct patient care, which is really what doctors are supposed to be doing, they're spending about 50% of their time doing that. The rest of the time, they're doing a lot of the other stuff, okay? And um, if you now take, how much time does a provider spend with each patient when the patient walks into the room? From the time the patient walks to the time the patient leaves, in direct or indirect care of the patient, okay? About three minutes in, in direct care and you know, two to three minutes for direct care of the patient. So about seven to eight minutes total talking to the patient about their care or things that are relevant to their care, okay? And then let's go to the other side of the patients uh, in terms of what happened to patients. First of all, we look at the census. <coughs> um, 
you know, about 119 patients, uh, 107 at the other clinic, but the range is, you know, one day they get 71, the other day they get 197. Same with the other clinic, 62 and 172, okay? And then the mean patient visit length was uh, uh, 77 minutes with a lot of variability and then 196 minutes at the other clinic, okay? Now, how do patients spend their time, okay? So, <laughs> waiting, right? So, like, most of the time they're just hanging out and then a little bit of time kind of getting care, okay? Uh, so, it doesn't take much brain power to figure out what types of discussions we can have about this, right? You know, providers who are supposed to be there are not there. You know, when they're there, most of their time is actually spent on tasks that are not related to what they're supposed to be doing. And you could kind of come up with many, many things that are not even health information technology related to kind of help uh, the system work better. And this list cannot be exhaustive in any way because there are so many possible things there, okay? Same with the patients, right? Uh, the good thing about, again, time motion data is you kind of identify where most of the bottlenecks are. In this case, it was actually waiting for the clinician. Um, and then, of course, you know, large variability in start time, end times, patient censuses, and things like that, okay? Now, the people in this class can spend time figuring out, you know, how do you manage the queue better because you've read your academic papers about how to do it. But, I mean, when you go to the real world, it's going to be slightly different, a little bit complex model, and also the medical system is what you call a complex adaptive system. So what you think theoretically works might not actually end up working there, or it could, be, uh, it could lead to other changes that uh, counter what you're trying to do. So again, whatever implementation you end up having for managing the hospital flow, you have to actually look to see if that's the true effect, okay? You could take advantage of the waiting time, okay? And actually, a lot of the patients there don't have a problem waiting, you know, because they just end up chatting with their friends. And, but, you know, you could actually use that opportunity because if they come there once a month or once every two months, it's a perfect opportunity to do other things, okay? But I think uh, one of your articles uh, which said something which is very obvious, you know, assign responsibility for something. Obviously, and this to me is... Uh, what you typically find uh, in some of our settings is nobody cares, you know? <laughs> like, it's almost like nobody um, is saying, okay, the clinic has not started in good time, you know, we need to get going on. These patients are waiting too long. So somehow the system needs to figure out a way of getting the leadership to get some of these things moving, okay? And then, of course, figure out ways to manage the census better, you know? whether it's telling some people to come in the afternoon, because in the afternoon, there's almost nobody. Everybody's in the morning, or evening out the days and things like that, okay? Anyway, we found that stuff because we were trying <laughs> to figure out how our system would impact the care. Uh, I mean, the care system itself. But the care system itself is kind of not functioning very well. We implemented OpenMRS, which you are all very familiar with, and it's been implemented in a whole bunch of places. And the system we implemented had uh, an ugly looking summary, but it was a summary nonetheless of the patient's kind of clinical data, okay? And basically what we did is just compare what, happens, what happened before and what happened after our system was implemented. Obviously after the first set of data came in, which was like late 2006, early 2007, people started changing. Doctors started showing up a little bit more for work, so now they're spending six and a half hours instead of, you know, five hours. Uh, so, number of physicians was the same, hours in clinic was about the same before and after. The amount of time, nothing here is statistically significantly different between the before and after time period. The number of doctors we're dealing with is very small. You know, it's hard to really tell that much. At least what we can tell those guys is, oh, by the way, we didn't make things that much worse off, okay? But some of the negatives that have changed could most likely not have anything to do with our electronic medical record system, more that between the pre- and post-implementation period, something might have changed, okay? Um, and then if you look at the time, there was a concern that, oh, if you implement this system, our doctors are going to be spending a lot longer doing some 
paperwork, like indirect care type of stuff. And basically what we showed is, you know, before and after the system is in place, they don't spend that much time doing more the uh, writing of charts and things like that, which was what um, one of, uh, was one of the concerns by the Ministry of Health and the WHO, okay? And, you know, they spend a little bit more time taking direct care of patients. Um, and again, you can spin that whichever way you want. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? I'd say it's a good thing, okay? Now, if you look at patient time before and after implementation, the things that I a little bit highlighted are the ones which were statistically uh, significantly different, meaning P less than 0 0.05. Um, again, you find that they end up spending more time with staff, a little bit more time with pharmacy. But to me, that has nothing to do with the electronic medical record system. It's just what we observed. And again, I think there are some other systemic changes in between. Um, but they ended up waiting a lot less than they were waiting before. So what, what, what we are showing here is our system is not making things that much more worse. And of course, there are some things going on in the background in these organizations to, uh, to tell us uh, that things are improving somewhat. And you ask the providers, do you like this system? Do you like this summary? And you know, they're like, yeah, we are satisfied with the summary. You know, we don't think it's difficult to understand. You know, uh, it's often complete. So they, they, in general, the satisfaction is fine, okay? Now, so doesn't make things worse. They're satisfied with it. Nothing to do with quality of care necessarily at this point. Just nice operational data, you know. But at least answers a question if somebody comes and says, do these systems always make your, the healthcare system inefficient? You can point to something like this and say, not necessarily. But again, a lot of it might depend on how the implementation is done. Okay. The other part uh, you have to think about is um, what uh, implementation models will work to make sure that you bring down the costs, and then can we do other things that have more direct patient impact? Okay. I just put this up there uh, to just highlight some of the ways you can implement it. If you look at the way Rwanda, for example, is implementing uh, partners in health systems, and the way we are implementing our systems at AMPATH, we have our own guys, we have our own programmers, our own IT people doing everything. But in some of these smaller clinics, what you need is actually a central governing body that can do most of the high level technical stuff. And then uh, on the ground, you just have like data entry clerks and uh, basic IT people who end up actually providing most of the services. So somebody has to be thinking about what models of implementation can work in these settings uh, that do not depend on Western expertise and also do not depend on very highly trained IT personnel, okay? Now, the big push for health information technologies um, to say, you know what, we can actually improve quality of care if we use whatever data we gather to remind providers when they're missing stuff, okay? Uh, so that's kind of the realm of kind of computerized clinical decision support. And I just want to, uh, walk you through some of the work we've done in Kenya, which Hamish, I think, pointed a little bit to, uh, that tries to get to, you know, some of the quality of care issues. So in this case, we are trying to say, well, are the patients actually getting appropriate evaluation for their care, okay? Um, this work is done in uh, the USID AMPATH program in Western Kenya. It's actually one of the largest uh, HIV treatment programs in Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, and I hope people know where Kenya and Uganda is because I didn't give you a big map of Africa. Uh, I don't know where some countries are, so I don't make any assumptions. Um, so this is one of the clinics, just to give you, um, give you an example of how different some of the care uh, provision is in those settings, okay? So what you observe here is, one, it will be a little bit difficult to have a computer right here uh, in this kind of setting where you almost have no desk space, you know, and then you have a couple of patients sitting next to each other and most likely um, they don't have electricity, okay? So the way we end up implementing our systems, and I don't know if you explained this to them, so some of the systems where you have a paper-based encounter form, which is almost like your checklist to make sure that the providers actually do the things you want them to do, okay? And then that uh, encounter form goes to a data entry kind of place and uh, the OpenMRS interface, which you see on the right, 
uh, is almost similar to um, the paper-based encounter form. The data entry clerks don't need to know much medicine, or almost none, because everything is right in front of them. They just have to, um, to record that information. Again, potentially a source of error there, though. And uh, from that, then, you know, you can generate a patient clinical, a patient specific clinical summary that can be made available to the provider because they don't have computers, you have to do it on paper or some other approaches which like handheld devices or things like that. And then at the bottom what we've done is we have specific reminders based on the data we have for the patient on, um, on what um, the care guidelines should be that they haven't complied with, okay? In this case, for example, patients I do for a repeat CD4 if they're on antiretrovirals after every 12 months for this group, and a lot of the patients, they just weren't doing it, okay? So we didn't know whether they were actually uh, responding to the antiretrovirals or whether they were getting resistant to them, okay? Now, our first attempt at doing this failed, okay? And that's the part you never hear most of the time, okay? I mean, we just tried to do it and it just didn't work. So we wrote a paper about it. Um, so what ended up happening is just you know, the usual stuff, you know. The computers don't work, there's no power, we rent out of printer paper, you know, there are viruses, you know, just like every single thing that you can think about. And again, we've had a good chunk of experience with this. I mean, we've been doing this since 2001 at least. And this is 2007 and we're still having these problems, okay? And then the nurses basically just say, you know what, that's a little bit more work for me. I'm not printing the salaries, you know? Pay me more. And then, you know, occasionally you end up having, I think you guys are laughing because you can kind of uh, understand. No, you end up getting inaccurate reminders. So you have the best intentions. Turns out our labs, which are supposed to be imported automatically into our system, weren't getting imported because there are occasionally problems, right? So the providers still get their results through a paper format sometimes. And they're like, well, I have this result in front of me. How come your summary doesn't have the result? Okay? And then the data entry clerks also make errors, which, uh, so if they say a patient is not on antiretrovirals and they're on antiretrovirals, you end up getting a wrong, wrong reminder because these reminders are based on whether a patient is on antiretrovirals or not. Okay? And then occasionally there's just delay in data entry. Okay? And then sometimes the providers just think they know best, right? So they could be blatantly wrong, but they'll say, no, I'm not changing my practice pattern. And occasionally there might be a situation that's genuine. Maybe a patient is very sick on that day. There are a lot of other things going on that ordering CD4 might be the lowest thing on the priority for that day. So, um, And the point here is we know how to do this stuff. We've done it maybe lo longer than anybody has done it in sub-Saharan Africa, and we are running into this problem. Tell me what's going to happen when you say, now implement it throughout the country, okay? Um, anyway, so after all our struggles and spending a good chunk of money, you know, we have a system running now. Abbott Fund has been very nice to us. Uh, but you know, we are able to get summaries pretty reliably uh, to the sites and um, you know, we have different types of summaries based on what the patient characteristics are and uh, we keep increasing the number of reminders that we are giving to them. Okay? And I think you showed them this, right? It's like, well, so if you look, <coughs> let's say we took two clinics, one where we didn't implement uh, the reminder system and another one where we implemented the reminder system. If you look before the implementation, uh, basically, they are complying with about 30% order rates for the overdue CD4s, okay? If you look after the intervention, after the intervention, obviously the control group didn't get anything, okay? Whereas the intervention group were being told, hey, you need to order the CD4. You can see that the intervention group went from uh, uh, before implementation period of uh, percentage of 38 to 63% compliance, okay? Whereas the control group went from 36% to 42%, okay? So again, you almost double, um, you almost double uh, the compliance rates 
uh, with reminders. And obviously there's a big difference between the two clinics uh, uh, after the implementation because uh, most likely it's not because of changes within the clinic but because of uh, the, reminder, the reminder system in place. And again, these clinics are in the same building, same patient population, they're just, we call them modules. They're just different modules, okay? Now, that's, uh, you know, something about doing the appropriate evaluation, yes. I think it's a combination of several things. Um, one is now they have the information right in front of them versus having to go through the chat and try to figure out uh, whether it's there or not. The other thing is these guys sometimes are so busy anyway um, that even with the best intentions, there's a paper which uh, was written many, many years ago, which actually, or even the Institute of Medicine, to air is human, okay? Uh, to basically making, the Institute of Medicine has this report, I don't know if you've spoken to them about, called to air is human, which is basically saying human beings by nature will miss stuff, will make errors, okay? So uh, the way reminder systems work is basically just say, oh, by the way, we're not saying it's bad to be wrong, but you know, here's something that you might have missed. So even with the best intention, sometimes they could just miss stuff. Occasionally they're just too busy to go through everything as you're saying. Some cases they didn't even know that that was the guideline in itself, you know. So it's a combination of multiple things. Um, and it gets kind of, if you talk to medical informaticians, uh, there's this what you call the basic theorem of medical informatics is, you know, if you get a computer and a human being, they're going to be better than a human being. So it's kind of a combination of that, that type of stuff. Am I answering your question anyway? Uh, once a month, yeah, once a month. And also, what you can do in these types of studies and uh, or these types of analysis, you can say, well, how about if we looked at the compliance rates over six months instead of this per individual visit, right? So suppose I come to clinic today with no reminders, one provider misses. Next time I come to clinic, another provider misses. Maybe the third time somebody will catch it. So. Uh, when you look at this data also, you have to think, well, let us look at this over a period of time to really say, okay, this decision support uh, reminders actually make a difference because you might find that maybe after about six months, the gap might narrow or might get wider. You never know. But those are some of the things to look into when, when, when you read some of this stuff, okay? So what's the answer here? Uh, so in this case, it was per encounter, okay? We haven't looked at six months rate. And actually, we are, we are doing another study which is a little bit more robust than this. We are doing a randomized study because um, before and after is not the best kind of standard of, um, when you look at the quality of data, I mean the quality of the results, a randomized study is much better. And that's what we are doing right now, okay? So hopefully we'll have some answers for you soon, okay? So that was, yeah. Yeah. I mean, right from the first visit, we discuss with the patient that every six months we need to do a CD4 sampling. Yes. And I mean, every individual patient knows that we discuss their lab results with them yeah. and everything. If the guy comes six months and all the physicians miss it, yes. he should be known that from the Yeah. The I, study that checked the impact of that as compared to his experience. Yeah. We haven't checked, it's a great idea. And there's a move in terms of you know, what role should patients play in their care and what role uh, should physicians play or like in terms of what the relationship is there. I think that's a very interesting thing to do um, and actually could have some impact, uh, especially if you can explain to them and make them understand uh, some of these things. Because you end up finding that some patients actually are very, very vigilant about their health care and it's just a matter of education. We didn't do it, okay? Uh, and let me tell you why we didn't do it. It's because there's no money to do it, right? So typically when we do these things is um, you're answering a very specific question for very specific purpose, unless you have this like 
big grants like the Tef Semi she's getting. I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah, to kind of do, you know. So for example, here I'd say, well, we have 20 clinics. Why didn't we do them in all the 20 clinics, right? Because you'll need personnel at each of the clinics. So these things actually require a little bit of resources. But I think uh, patient-centric type of interventions actually can have a big potential impact. And some people have done work to that effect, okay? Uh, I wanted to touch on some of the quality of care staff. Uh, how many more minutes do I have? Um, oh, yeah, I'll be done. Um, some of the qu other quality of care type stuff that we've done just to have. Did you have a question? Yes. Sir. Yes. yes uh, I think I kind of discussed it in some discussion ago mm -hmm. that uh, no is not the type of table that should um, generate the, 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 the appropriate incentive to, to provide such. Uh, I know that from experience. So very good point. Uh, uh, so first of all, most of, our, most of us are the providers in this setting, just to um, give you some background. So, but the more I do this, the, more, the deeper insight I get into just how the exact thing you're saying, what, what, what is the incentive for the provider in a particular setting? What I'm finding out is, for example, Kenya and Uganda might be very different. Like there's a lot of ingrained cultural things that might not actually make some logical sense on the surface to begin with. I'm going to get into anthropology, medical anthropology type stuff here. By nature, and anybody who designs this system will tell you, you don't implement things that you think work for you, okay? You implement things that should work for the providers in that setting. So, you know, you go to them and say, you know, is this what you want? You know, with, for example, one thing they've always wanted is tell us the date a drug was started, you know, but that we haven't implemented it because every time we try to implement, there are so many errors we can't really tell because they start, stop, start, stop. So you talk to them and say, you know, what makes sense in your priority of things uh, to have in uh, the clinical summary? You know, they come to you and say, these charts are too thick, we can't go through them. That's why we aggregate everything for them in the summary. So. One, you try as best as possible to conform to what you think they want. And then even after you implement, you keep talking to them uh, to say, you know, does this actually work for you or not? I can tell you, over the last two days or so, I've changed a summary maybe four times, just because they keep saying, well, the wording for this is not right. But that's what you do. I mean, what's that? What's that? Yeah. Now, let, let me go to the other side, OK? What I'm finding, though, is, and uh, I hope nobody will, is going to kill me here. Sometimes these guys actually don't care about the patient. I mean, it's, it's a little bit crazy, but you know, you're like, well, I have everything in front of you here. Uh, can you explain to me why you're not doing it? And 
It just doesn't make sense. Like you could be in a hospital and you say, okay, this patient has diabetic ketoacidosis. We need to check the blood sugar and you need to give the insulin or the patient will die. And then somebody doesn't do it. And once you start getting into why they are not doing it, it becomes a lot more complicated than just I have too much work or I have something else going on. So there are some other larger systemic things going on that we can discuss outside this forum. Uh, but simply saying, you know, people are rational thinkers and they'll do what's the best for the patient all the time, even when you make their lives easier, doesn't always translate, okay? I'll give you another example. Just yesterday, we have a reminder for them, for kids saying, if the C score is less than 1.5, refer the patient to nutrition, right? So the child is severely malnourished. We have a nice nutrition program that should work. So 10 times, somebody checked on the encounter form saying, I referred the patient to nutrition. What do we do? We go to nutrition, see if the patient was seen. 10 out of 10 times, the patient was not seen at nutrition. Okay? And then you say, well, what's going on here? Isn't nutrition seeing our patients? You know, what's, what else is going on? Oh, the provider's like, oh, we just checked on the encounter, but we didn't fill a referral form, which they're supposed to fill, to tell them to go to nutrition. And there's a good chance we didn't tell them to go to nutrition. Okay? So you're like, so, but every time you dig, it's just a little bit more complicated. That's why when, you know, think about simplistic kind of operational research standpoint gets, I mean, these are small baby steps to improve a system. And some of our interventions are only just uncovering some of the system's problems. And hopefully you work through them and eventually get somewhere that works. I don't know if I answered your question. Oh, I tried. Um, <laughs> yeah. couldn't agree with you more, okay? So in fact, we were joking today, we were like, are we really evaluating health IT or are we, are we doing a health IT intervention or are we doing a health system intervention? Anyway, uh, some of the other work we've done, I'll take two minutes on this. You've got 10 minutes. 10? Yeah. Okay, I'll take 10 minutes, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I kind of alluded to this earlier on in my slide, just some, some of the other work we're doing. So you have a whole bunch of people who are HIV positive, but they just don't know their status because they've never been tested, okay? Uh, now, health system, uh, in terms of identifying uh, people who are at risk of diseases, for example, if you're HIV positive, risk of AIDS, and it's uh, the association opportunistic infections, and then also just making sure that the people get the appropriate diagnosis, right? So we are doing the um, home health counseling and testing program uh, where we had just decided, you know what? We've tried to treat people for the last 10 years, and they just keep showing up. If we're going to actually take care of staff, we need to take care of people when, uh, before they end up having AIDS, and also before they infect uh, other people, okay? So you now we decided, you know, let's go to the community and do this. Uh, in this case, you know, it's very difficult to have a paper system and things like that, so we said, Let's try an electronic system which can help us get the data into the electronic medical record and things like that. In this case, health IT is just part of a larger care system and hopefully uh, we'll make it a little bit more efficient. Okay. The goals of our home visits outlined here, we want to identify HIV patients who are not aware of their status, offer services for those who have been identified, identify pregnant women who are not getting antenatal care, especially those who are HIV positive, identify orphaned and vulnerable children, children who don't have appropriate immunization, people who are at risk of TB, we get sputum counsels, uh, samples from those, uh, do some rapid HIV testing for everyone, get, give some deworming medication and uh, give some bed nets. So it's really a comprehensive program and your health IT tool is really just 
to assist the program. Okay? And again, talking about you know, engaging the stakeholders, this is kind of, you know, you go to the community and you talk to the leaders of the hospitals and things like that because they'll be getting a big influx of patients. You know, deciding what, what things to collect and what things not to collect, especially because everybody, when something like this comes up, wants to do something for their project, but maybe the community has some other interests in terms of what they want to collect themselves. And then, you know, understand how it's, it's going to work and how it's going to actually get implemented. So we ended up creating this um, handheld data collection system, which was pretty comprehensive, uh, household information with GPS locations. We can talk about that later. Um, and then some different modules, HIV module example here I'm giving you, kind of getting the HIV testing history and also the results of the test done during that, um, during the home-based counseling and testing process, doing some TB screening questions and also uh, giving some referrals for those who turn out to be positive or not immunized or things like that, okay? First version of our system, this was before the fancy smartphones. We had just a PDA and then an external GPS device connected via cable, okay? Uh, community mobilization, kind of just making sure that the leaders and everyone can say, okay, you can go to our households and uh, talk to the people in the different households, just giving kind of community consent before you go to the household and get household consent, okay? And then, you know, you have your teams that are armed with their GPS devices and smartphones and the HIV testing kits. You have now the rapid testing kits which give you results very fast. Um, and you know, the home already knows that they're gonna be coming and you know, it's like the AMPAT people are coming, so they wait for them. Um, and there are a lot of discussion points here, but you know, the counseling sometimes is given to the whole house, like to, with everybody there or to just the husband and wife and then the kids or to each person individually. Uh, the family decides. Uh, then you do the testing. Again, sometimes it's done individually, sometimes it's done uh, together. Um, and basically those are some of the testing kits. And then, of course, you collect, uh, you record the data in your handheld device. And this was from 2008. We've tested uh, maybe 400, 500,000 people by now. Uh, but... So yeah. Okay. Um, but uh, some of the things... No, for example, 45% of the women were pregnant, but they'd never gone to, for an antenatal care. Um, we had um, 693 uh, 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 of the HIV positive patients, basically 61.3% of the HIV positive patients identified had never known that they were HIV positive uh, and had never sought care for it. Um, and about 376 individuals were at high risk for TB and they'd never really been tested for it, so we took some sputum cancels, uh, samples. And there's a lot more data to, to this, but this is just one of the manuscripts that we wrote on this. Um, so the idea was to kind of test two million people in three years, kind of estimate how many PDS you'll need. Yes? Yeah, just a quick question. Um, yeah. What was the positive mortality rates for your test? Um, actually, we do two tests, back-to-back, uh, -back, and then we do a third tiebreaker test. And I think it was like, you know, 97, 98% type thing for sensitivity specificity type when you do that combination. Yeah, I remember we had uh, big arguments about whether if somebody was positive, should we do a second test, na, na, na. So I think now, so we, ch we eventually change it where if you're positive, we don't do a second test. If you are negative, we do a second test, and then if it's different, we tie break. Because after looking at those numbers, we didn't see the reason. If you did once and it turned out positive, you had to do it again. Okay? Uh, but I can get to the exact numbers uh, for it. Okay? Um, Quick question. Yeah. So uh, in testing these people, uh, I guess you have the resources in place to treat people who get identified HIV? Yes. And yeah, that, that was the key because we have, um, our program has about 23 clinics in that catchment area and 23 satellite clinics affiliated with those clinics. So basically our clinics cover the, all, the whole area and part of the preparation process was to tell uh, our clinics 
you're going to be getting more people. And we're doing the same thing now for hypertension, uh, saying, you know, if you go to the community and start checking blood pressures and blood sugars for diabetes, who's going to be taking care of these people? So we need to come up with a, a, a better model for taking care of those people. Otherwise, it's silly to say, hey, you have HIV, good luck, you know? So, yeah. And again, try to put some costs to, to the system, taking, let's say, you know, how, how often do our devices break, you know? Uh, how many, um, how much programming time do you need? You know, just, this is not a rigorous kind of cost analysis uh, by any means, but at least it gives you some numbers of how much it would cost us from a technology standpoint to actually implement this. Of course, there's still the costs associated with um, testing people, hiring the council, and things like that. But if you are to, going to compare the technology versus using a paper system, which has to be transcribed or entered into a database, you find that actually using the technology might actually be cheaper than having all these encounters in paper forms, hiring data entry clerks who we pay about 17 bucks a day uh, to enter about 80 forms a day. Okay? So just kind of some stuff. Now we've, uh, we've implemented this in Android. Um, Open Data Kit is a nice uh, um, uh, Android-based kind of tool which has different things where uh, it can support data collection, data display, voice, and things like that. So we are doing it on ODK right now. But again, I can stand here and say it's nice and easy, but this is sometimes what happens. When, in fact, the other day they had to take boats to get to one of the place because it's an island and so it's just life. But then when you go there, you find that no, people are actually sick, okay? And some people thought they could be HIV positive, turn out to be negative. So you could actually have counter effects. But anyway, um, so that's my talk. Oh, and then at the end of the day, with the, all the skepticism about, you know, does health IT help or not, kind of having a framework saying, okay, if you're going to implement a health IT solution, um, what's a nice approach for it, you know? Kind of uh, Bill, Bill Stead came up with a nice outline of how you could do that, okay? Thank you, and I think I can open for questions and discussions.